Welcome everyone. My name is Paul Stevers and I'm the conference chair. It is a real honor for me to introduce our moderator for this session about the highlights of the World Climate and Security Report 2020. His name is General Tom Minendorp and is the chair of the International Military Council on Climate and Security. Previously, he served as the Netherlands Chief of Defense for five and a half years and after 38 years of serving his country as the, as the Chief of Defense, um, he uh, was the most senior advisor to the Minister of Defense responsible for readiness and the international cooperation and modernization of the Dutch Armed Forces, as well as planning and execution of its military deployments. He commanded uh, troops at all levels, led a multinational task force in the south of Afghanistan, and was involved in over 20 military missions with the Director of Operations. His current occupation is independent senior expert on defense and security and allows him to continue his work on the impact of climate change on security environment and on the role the military can play in addressing climate change. Here's Tom Minendorf. Uh, thank you, Paul, and welcome all to this uh, panel discussion where we will have four expert speakers talking about the scope and the urgency of the problem of climate change from a security perspective. And the discussion in this panel will be about the why. Why is action needed? Why do we need to invest in building resilience all over the world? Why is climate change also a matter of national security? Uh, and the what to do about it will be discussed in other panels. So we are scoping the problem. And we do this based on the World Climate and Security Report 2020. This was the first report that gave a global overview of how climate change affects security in the different parts of the world. And this report is kind of a heads up for the next crisis to come, the next crisis we are all facing, a potentially existential crisis affecting all elements of our societies. And the COVID crisis, the current COVID crisis should make us realize how vulnerable we are to, change it, to changes in our global ecosystem. We live in a global village. We cannot hide behind oceans, behind dikes, or behind national boundaries. And this report, the World Climate and Security Report 2020 was launched at the Munich Security Conference last year. It had a lot of impact. It triggered a lot of discussions. And we now see NATO, EU, and other security institutions developing its policies on uh, how to cope with climate change and the role that they can play in this. And what, this, what makes this report also quite special is that it are not the climate activists who are ringing the alarm bells, but this time it are the senior military leaders and experts from intelligence communities that are raising the flag. Because they have experienced, they have experienced in Afghanistan how water shortages fueled local tensions and provided opportunities for the Taliban to gain control of local populations. They've experienced in Somalia how farmers and fishermen turned into pirates and joined Al-Shabaab. They've experienced in Iraq how access to drinking water was being weaponized by Daesh to gain control over populations. They've experienced in Mali how the tensions as a result of food and water shortages raised and opened the doors for extremist organizations and organized crime. And all these senior military leaders are worried when they look at all the warners and indicators turning red. To all these leaders, it's very clear that climate change is much more than an environmental problem. It's probably the biggest game changer we are facing this century. And it's also a matter of national security. And these experts have united themselves in the IMCCS, the International Military Council on Climate and Security, working together with a consortium of research centers. Not with the aim to securitize climate change, but with the aim to climatize security, to build awareness from a security perspective, to exchange best practices, and to develop the role of security institutions that security institutions can fulfill as part of a whole of society effort. And we all need the, those efforts to really deal with the change that climate change is bringing. Now, the first speaker in our panel will be Rachel Fleischmann. Uh, she's a senior fellow at the Asia Pacific Center 
uh, for climate and security, and also the Asia Pacific liaison at the IMCCS. She has a background of working uh, on national security policy in the Pentagon and in NATO. And she also worked for the Deputy Undersecretary of Defense on Environmental Security, where she helped build the Pentagon's International Environmental Security Program. She has fulfilled several functions in the Asia Pacific area, including directing the climate change business forum in Hong Kong. Rachel is very well positioned to explain the risks this region is facing as a result of climate change and how it affects us. After the introduction of Rachel, I'll give room for a Q&A. So please, if you have any questions, fill them in during uh, the session. And after each speaker, I will give some space for, for a quick for Q&As. Rachel, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, General Mindorp, and, and to Paul and the organizers. It's a delight to be here with you today. Um, in my short seven minutes, I want to give you a quick tour of Asia. Climate security threats are really starting to roil South and Southeast Asia. In general, these countries are more vulnerable to climate change than we're experiencing in the West and less able to, less prepared to, um, to adapt to it. The big four in terms of climate security from my perspective are devastating storms that often require a military humanitarian response, crippling heat that's already causing climate migrants, coastal megacities and rich agricultural lands that are being succumbed and overwhelmed by sea level rise and competition over dwindling resources like clean water and fish. We're gonna go first to Southeast Asia. Uh, and to give you a quick orientation, uh, the 10 countries of ASEAN are an economic success story. 650, young, uh, 650 million people, a young skilled workforce, a robust GDP growth of about 5% prior to the pandemic, fifth largest uh, economy in the world, a major destination for European and North American FDI, the sixth largest uh, trading partner for Canada in such tech areas as aerospace defense, uh, IT infrastructure and clean tech. But this economic success story is at risk from climate change because the basic systems upon which human life depends, food, water, shelter, energy, transport, and commerce are all at risk from climate change. And I'm just gonna talk about one situation right now, and that is the Mekong River. Now the reality of rivers is that the upstream party, he who controls the headwaters often has the most power. So the Mekong starts in the Tibetan Plateau, China, and then flows through Myanmar, Laos, Thailand, Cambodia, and Vietnam, supporting 60 million people and the largest inland fishery in the world. Now, in 2019, the water in the Mekong dropped more than it had in 100 years. Farmers were not able to plant rice. Fishermen saw their catch plunge. Millions of lives were affected. So as a business person, you would think, okay, what's going to happen to my investments? What's going to happen to my supply chains? What do I need to be prepared for? If you're a military commander, you're thinking, okay, how is this going to affect my operational tempo? What deployable resources do I have? Where are my troops going to be called? The culprit, though, is not a state actor or even a rogue actor. It was climate change. Directly because there was a drought that year, the monsoons didn't come. Indirectly because the thirst for clean energy meant that there was a lot of dam building upstream, particularly in China and Laos. Now, when this happened, uh, the U.S. State Department funded a survey done by uh, a nonprofit Eyes on Earth and found that the water missing corresponded to about the amount of water that could be reserved by 11 Chinese dams that had been built upstream in the last 10 years. Now, China eventually admitted to reducing the water flow from one of the dams um, and, and was probably part, but certainly not all of the problem. In this particular incident, there was, no, there was no proof of malfeasance. But you can see what we would call the situation analysis. You've got strong up, up, upstream actors, no transparency, no coordination, a lack of trusted data sources, and weak institutions for diplomacy. There was no forum for talking about either cooperation on how river waters were controlled or even what the right data was. And all this has been exacerbated by climate change. So looking forward, and this has actually started again this year in February, there was another drop in river water, uh, 2021, 
at best, even without malfeasance, you can imagine additional accidental human suffering, economic devastation. At worst, there's the potential for water manipulation or so-called water wars. So we're gonna leave that one there. Move west, uh, South Asia. Now, South Asia is less well-developed than, than Southeast Asia. We've got 2 billion people who are already struggling with extreme poverty, water stress, poor governance, and gen a general lack of energy, even before the uh, pandemic took, uh, took part. Uh, Canadian investment levels, again, I was looking at Canada, uh, much lower in this part of the world, um, but starting to build up in infrastructure and private equity. There's been a lot of tech, there's, as you know um, from the news, um, a lot of investment in manufacturing, particularly of pharmaceuticals. Um, but South Asia suffers from both domestic turmoil, so extremist and separatist groups um, that are challenging state actors, and migration prompted by both poverty and climate change. And on the interstate side, longstanding international conflicts, notably between nuclear armed Pakistan, India, and China. So in South Asia, I want to bring you in and focus, if you imagine a map, zoom into the contested border area between India and China, right on the Brahmaputra. This area has been a standoff of troops for both sides, but it's been pretty lightly armed uh, and, and lightly patrolled until about a year ago when uh, there was a competition. There was a, well, depending on who you ask uh, the other one, there was an aggression from one side or the other. There was a clash uh, and so soldiers on both sides died and the troop levels all of a sudden surged to 100,000. Um, the tension surged over into the commercial world. China launched cyber attacks India responded with boycotts of Chinese tech companies. Um, and, and there was a, a flurry of sort of diplomatic activity to try to bring down tensions. We recently produced a study, we being the uh, Center for the Council for Strategic Risks uh, and the Woodwell Center for Climate Research in Woods Hole, Massachusetts, last week released a study of this particular area looking at what happens to the Brahmaputra as it winds down uh, from China into, uh, in, into uh, India. It starts in the Tibetan Plateau, flows through India and Bangladesh, and in normal years, there's a lot of variability. There's flooding downstream in, in, uh, in affecting millions of people in India. Looking forward, the projected climate indicators are a warning trend, which will get worse a major flood in India could be construed very easily as an act of deliberate manipulation by the Chinese, whether or not this is true. And this is even more a concern now because tensions are so high. In fact, it could be construed as a, an act of war, but the analysis actually gets worse. In addition to climate change, increasing glacier melt and water variability, China has recently announced plans for a massive hydrological project uh, just 40 kilometers north of the Indian border in a seismically unstable area. They want to build, they plan to build the world's largest dam, about three times the size of the existing Great Bend Dam, uh, Great Three, Three Gorges Dam in China, um, which was interpreted by India as a threat. They, they see it as China being able to withhold water in a dry season and release it in wet. So now we've got a multiplying factor. Um, the threats are both material and perceptual. So situation analysis, you've got a strong upstream actor, a lack of transparency and coordination, no mutually trusted data sources, no treaty, no international institutional frameworks for diplomacy or negotiation, all exacerbated by climate change. And you've got two nuclear armed actors um, who are on a hair trigger. Now I see gentleman Dorp appearing, which means I'm running out of time. Um, so the bottom line here is that shot fired in Asia may be heard or felt around the world um, and that climate indicators need to be taken into account in sensitive security situations. And they're all set. Well, thank you, Rachel. Uh, a, a very dangerous mix of ingredients, as you explained, because uh, we don't realize how dependent we are on this region, how our economies depend on, the, on this region, how our supply chains depend on this region. Uh, 
Uh, and if we see this mix of, of sea level rise, potential floodings, uh, water and food shortages, uh, dams building, controlling water supply over other countries, uh, it's a very dangerous mix affecting billions of people. Just imagine the, the melting of the glaciers in the Tibetan Plateau, uh, taking away the, the, the lifeline of these billions of people, what the effect can be of, of, of a disaster like that. It's almost unimaginable. Uh, so uh, I think we need to take this very, very serious. And I saw a question coming in from, I can't see from who, but I think it was Helen. She said, you speak of the economic success story of the Southeast Asia. Is there a concern that the costs associated with dealing with climate change and curbing emissions will dampen economic growth? And if so, how do we address that? Not an easy question to answer, but it's a balance. Eh? On the one hand, it's, uh, there is a lot of economic benefit. On the other hand, there are lots of costs involved in dealing with it. And how does the one interfere with the other? No, it's a great question. And there's actually quite a lot of work being done on that. Um, in fact, there's a lot of hidden costs to all the coal that's being burned in South and Southeast Asia right now. It's, it's having a, a deleterious effect on the economy uh, because of the air pollution, uh, because of the smog, because planes can't land, because people are getting sick and dying from air pollution. So the switch to clean energy is actually going to spur new jobs, new technology, but also cleaner air and, and healthier uh, environment uh, for which businesses to invest and people to live. Um, but there still is this difficulty of, of switching over in a, a short amount of time from, from the old ways and from old energy to new energy. Uh, the World Economic Forum actually has a paper suggesting how this could be done um, with, with positive finance, which I don't have time to go into here. Um, but I, I think um, that's your question is one of the reasons why the Southeast Asian states have not yet come out with their net zero uh, um, commitments yet, because they're still trying to figure that out. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Rachel. And looking at time, I think we need to move on to our next speaker. And our next speaker is uh, Steve, Steve Brock. Uh, and Steve Brock is a, a senior advisor with the Council on Climate, on the, with the Council on Strategic Risks and the Center of Climate and Security. He also worked, uh, works as the Chief of Staff of the IMCCS, the International Military Council on Climate and Security. And he has a military background. Uh, his last functions include being the chief of staff of the deputy director of the joint staff in the Pentagon. Uh, and he also co-chaired the interagency policy committee at the White House, White House Council on Environmental Quality. Uh, furthermore, he was director for Asia Security Affairs at the National Security Council. So he's well positioned to explain the accelerating climate impacts in North, Central, and South America, and how that affects our economies and our security. Steve, the floor is yours. Thank you, General. Uh, and thanks, thanks to everyone for participating in this uh, great event. I'm gonna cover uh, seven themes uh, in seven minutes. So uh, right off the bat, the first is uh, readiness and training for uh, your military forces, for, for all of our sons and daughters, uh, that go into harm's way. And fire is what I'm gonna start with on that. Uh, as you know, uh, extensive fires in the US, uh, Canada, elsewhere in North America, that actually has a tremendous impact on uh, some of our major training bases for joint and combined live fire training uh, for our forces before they deploy overseas, specifically uh, in Camp Pendleton and Fort Irwin in California. Uh, and that, that is a real, uh, very real training and readiness issue for sending guys uh, and gals overseas uh, fully ready for their missions. Uh, the second is uh, strategic context. We have multiple strategic bases uh, that actually provide a global function, both in ballistic missile defense, uh, space uh, debris warning, et cetera, on uh, islands in the Indian Ocean and the Pacific that are uh, threatened by uh, saltwater inundation for the individuals that work and operate those strategic uh, radars and, and other systems. Um, something that uh, was not part of the calculus when they, when they were placed there, uh, in many cases recently. Uh, further, a very poignant strategic aspect for me um, is, uh, is something that uh, Rachel hit on earlier. I worked on the strategic rebalance, the U.S. strategic rebalance to Asia over a decade ago, and uh, that is a big theme uh, right now currently with the great power competition uh, in U.S.-China security relations. 
but the uh, the Asian century, which drove that, um, and that century that may still be, um, is obviously uh, going to be affected by things that weren't considered and all the trends that pointed to uh, great prosperity in that part of the world. And that is the uh, threat to, uh, of sea level rise and flooding to some of the most prosperous economic engines of Asia. Uh, the next theme is uh, fuel uh, and fossil fuel transition, energy transition, and what the security implications of that are. Uh, just within uh, the Western hemisphere, you have a Venezuela major petroleum producer. Mexico has just recently, a few months ago, uh, advantaged its petroleum industry over renewable energies. And of course, there are um, issues to be worked out between the US and Canada on energy uh, going forward with our, our drive for uh, reducing fossil fuel emissions. So that is a big aspect around the globe that we need to think about security wise and how to make that a, a transition that does, need, does not lead to uh, too much uh, conflict and suffering. Uh, the next theme is mass migration. Two major hurricanes hit Central America last December, uh, the latest in the season in November ever recorded. A category four and category five affected one third of the population um, in three countries in the region. And that only exacerbates those fragile societies that are dealing with endemic corruption, gang violence, uh, joblessness, a whole host of traditional um, challenges that drive migration towards, in, our, in the Western Hemisphere's case, through Mexico and up to the US border, which is a major uh, both domestic political consideration and uh, regional uh, foreign policy consideration for the US, as, as you're all aware. Um, that situation is only gonna get worse as climate change continues to bear down with extreme weather and drought uh, in the Central American region. Uh, the fifth theme is, you know, what do we do security wise or what are the security considerations for nation states or non-state actors that purposely uh, have policies that degrade our climate readiness and uh, degrade climate progress. Case in point, uh, President Bolsonaro in Brazil, uh, you know, he's been uh, referred to the International Criminal Court for ecocide for uh, Brazilian government's policies for uh, environmental destruction of the Amazon uh, and that critical function that 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 part of the world plays as, the, as our planet's lungs uh, for pulling uh, CO2 out of the atmosphere and uh, the, the tremendous um, suffering it's put on indigenous peoples in those areas. How do we as a global community think about security for nation states that might not be pulling their weight or doing what needs to be done uh, to head off this existential threat? Uh, the sixth theme is uh, bringing in new stakeholders, new investors, um, very high capacity and capability organizations that are active in the climate sphere, bringing them into the security sphere. One good example is in Colombia, uh, first peace treaty in the history of the world to have sustainability and climate as a, as a core tenet. And also uh, that was sort of very much dependent upon bringing in those uh, countries and those organizations that had invested billions in carbon offsets in the rainforest in Colombia uh, to uh, help create a carbon tax and also underwrite FARC uh, reintegration into society and also funds uh, you know, responsible, sustainable, rural economic developments in vast areas of the Amazon rainforest that the FARC had had under its control for decades that are now open for um, economic development and to head off the standard uh, slash and burn agriculture and other um, resource extraction that leads to um, environmental degradation and climate exacerbation. Uh, and the final theme I'd like to, to, to make is geoengineering. Um, that is human intervention in the climate system uh, to try to reverse global warming either solar radiation management by putting particulate into the stratosphere to reflect the sun's rays, which has great implications, for instance, for photosynthesis in agriculture, or another option, iron ocean seeding, uh, making the oceans massive uh, carbon sinks. All of these things, just think about the unintended consequences, think about the global scale of them, think about the sovereignty issues and the fact that we don't have an international governance mechanism, a treaty mechanism at the UN or elsewhere for dealing with geoengineering and, and large scale innovation into, into the uh, climate system. All of that is a major security concern that doesn't get a lot of attention because it's going to be more and more likely as we progress down a path um, where nation states or non-state uh, actors decide to take those kind of matters uh, into their own hands. And with that, I will, uh, I will cede my remaining time uh, back to the general. Thank you, Steve. Well, many uh, avenues of approach, as you mentioned them. You're almost overwhelmed uh, the audience, I would say. Uh, we, we often think that in the West, we are safe for climate change, don't we? Uh, we, we think it's a problem for other areas, uh, 
in other parts of the world, it doesn't affect us. Okay, we contribute with uh, emission reductions, but that's about it. Uh, what you showed is, is, is in how many ways climate change is affecting our lives and is a problem for our societies. Uh, what you showed is, our, for instance, the new records, uh, the breaking records every year on extreme weather events that also hit our homelands. Uh, so it's becoming more and more our problem. Also, climate change in other regions is our problem. Uh, we need to do more than just providing a little bit of aid to those regions. So. My question to you would be looking at this from a US perspective, how does climate change affect the, the national security policies? You've been involved in, in writing those and in editing those. Uh, what kind of changing, changes do you expect as a result of climate change? I think right now uh, we are going through a very transformative moment as far as national security policy in the United States goes. Uh, and that has been um, hitting full, full speed in the last several months. Uh, for the first time, the Pentagon has uh, recognized climate as a core mission. Um, and that's a major accomplishment because there are very few things that uh, raise to the level of being a core component um, of, our, of our military strategy. And it goes beyond uh, just preparing our forces to be able to, uh, to succeed in a climate changed environment but also in helping our partners and allies. Uh, there's a big emphasis on uh, sharing best practices going forward and also in doing our part to, uh, to mitigate um, and to, uh, to adapt and do the things that we need to do to do our part to help um, in climate change in general. That's also evident in the State Department and the National Security Council, which for the first time um, has a, a senior director for climate, specialist with the president for climate and a whole national climate advisor apparatus and then a whole special presidential presidential special envoy for climate in John Kerry. All of those uh, aspects um, through the national security process are bringing all of, all of those that have responsibility and something uh, to bring as far as solutions go to US uh, national security making policy on climate. Um, it's early days, the organizations are being put in place, the processes are, processes are being put in place and the ideas are in the competition of the marketplace right now to figure out which ideas are the best. Uh, to implement, and um, it's, a, it's a story that uh, still has to be written, but we look forward to working with the partners and allies on it going forward. Thank you, Steve. And uh, I've got another question from the audience. Uh, you, you mentioned the security implications of reducing fossil fuels, and some see nuclear energy as a cleaner alternative to fossil fuels. Uh, could you share your thoughts on the security implications of that, and do the potential benefits outweigh the potential risks? That is a very that is a very important question. Uh, the you know yes, of course, uh, nuclear energy um, can produce tremendous amounts of, of of energy and be a rapid replacement for um, stable energy that um, you know that right now we're working towards in the renewable sphere. Uh, from a security perspective, uh, of course, um, control of those fissile materials. Uh, also, you know, there's, there's many small reactors being built around the world. Um, most of those reactors are being built uh, by the Russians and the Chinese, uh, making sure that those reactors, A, are, you know, constructed up to the highest standards um, for safety, but also operated uh, in a way that's safe and sustainable uh, once they're turned over. And then also control of that material. Uh, to ensure that uh, either the waste nor the, you know, those that could potentially be used for other purposes uh, don't fall into the wrong hands. Uh, so that you've hit on a great point of a whole security, set of security uh, considerations that go beyond uh, climate security. But, but it is also a very powerful tool. Um, if climate is an existential threat and if we need to move uh, quickly, it needs to be on the table uh, as far as being uh, something that uh, can head off, um, you know, the, the, the rise in temperature. Okay, well, thank you for that, Steve. And then we'll move on to our next speaker, who's Erin uh, Sikorsky. Um, and she will explain the impact of climate change from, uh, from a NATO and more transatlantic perspective. So how does climate change affect NATO's core capabilities? How does it affect NATO's geopolitical environment and its security environment? Important questions that will shape NATO's future uh, strategies, tasks, and capabilities. And Aaron is the, uh, currently the deputy director of the, for the Center for Climate and Security, and also the director of the IMCCS. 
she served as a deputy director uh, of the Strategic Futures Group on the National Intelligence Council. Uh, and here she co-authored the quadrennial uh, Global Trend Reports. And she led the US in Intel Communities Climate Security Analysis. She's also the founding chair of the congressionally mandated Climate Security Advisory Council. So a, a real expert here on board, Erin, uh, and uh, I give the floor to you. Great, thank you so much, General Middendorp, and thanks to the organizers of the conference. It's a real honor to be on a panel with uh, Captain Brock and Rachel and Dr. Pohl. Uh, these are great experts on, on these topics. And of course, General Middendorp yourself, you know these better than anyone. Uh, so what I wanted to do in my remarks, as, as General Middendorp said, I'm going to look at this at, through the, the NATO and, and transatlantic perspective, but I want to take a step back and lay out how I like to think about and characterize climate security risks. And as I do that, I'm going to provide some examples of risks playing out in parts of the world that matter to NATO and Europe in particular, because I know this morning the uh, one of the keynote speeches that was given by Sherry Goodman talked also quite a bit about NATO. So I wanna compliment her remarks. And as other speakers have mentioned, all parts of the world face some level of risk. The timelines and exact impacts are different, but there are few, if any, parts of the globe that will be truly unaffected, which is why the International Military Council on Climate and Security produces the World Climate and Security Report. We look everywhere for the security risks posed by climate change. And as, as Steve alluded to, I think we're at a new moment a bit in the climate security discussion, both in the United States and in Europe. Uh, we're moving beyond just the questions and looks at what climate change means for infrastructure and readiness risks to military forces, which are important, but they aren't the whole picture of climate security. There's more widespread recognition now of the systemic and compounding risks that climate change poses across all aspects of international security. There's a recognition of a, new, of a need for new definitions, I think, of national security. And so that means for security institutions like NATO, they have to reimagine the security landscape they face and think about, is it, do they have a match, right, between their capabilities and their strategies and the actual risks and threats? that they face. The Global Trends Report that Tom mentioned from the US National Intelligence Council, which I co-authored in my previous job, actually identifies climate and environmental issues as a quote, structural driver of the future, as something that will set the parameters for how states and actors will operate around the world. And I think that's really important when we think of these climate security risks is how are we asking the right questions then in our analysis? How does climate change intersect with other security threats and how does it compound them? So the question isn't, is climate change a bigger risk than China, for example? But instead, as Rachel laid out, I think really eloquently, how does climate change affect competition with China? How does it shape Chinese foreign policy choices? How does it intersect with uh, competition that already exists between China and states in the region? So I think that's the framing that we need to adopt when thinking about these climate security risks and then thinking about why action, that'll lead us to the right actions to take uh, to address these risks. Uh, before I get into three different kind of buckets of risk, I think it's important also to think about the overarching challenges from the physical effects of climate change that you saw already through the remarks that Rachel and Steve made. One important thing to think about is the increasing variability. This is a theme everywhere. Old patterns no longer hold and new patterns are hard to discern because of how climate is affecting the physical environment. So communities that relied on certain patterns of rainfall, for example, those, those patterns don't exist anymore and the new ones are much more variable. The second overarching challenge from the physical effects of climate change is the rapidity of the change. That communities barely have time to recover from one hazard or one risk before the next one hits. And of course, this is most acute in parts of the global south, but it's also a problem in, in the global north as well. You see this in Houston in the United States being hit by, um, by hurricanes, or you can see it uh, other places as well. 
So those are two kind of overarching themes that, again, I think are important to think about when we think about NATO and how it needs to adjust and how these security institutions need to adjust. So let me very quickly then talk about kind of the three areas of risk and give you some examples of how they play out in the, in the NATO context. And the first is one that, that Steve talked about are these direct threats to infrastructure, military operations, military readiness, the risks to military bases, the increase in the need for humanitarian assistance and disaster relief missions, and the need to be able to operate in increasingly austere environments. And here I would give the example of extreme heat as an escalating risk for NATO troops and equipment, particularly those deployed in operations and training missions in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Sub-Saharan Africa. And already the average number of hot days per year in Afghanistan increased by 25 days between 1960 and 2003. Similarly, scientists assess warming in Iraq is far above the global average with temperatures 2.3 degrees Celsius warmer in the past five years than at the end of the 19th century, about double the amount of warming seen on earth as a whole in the same time period. A US Army War College study in 2019 found that the simple need for water in these increasingly arid environments poses a logistical challenge, noting that in the 2000s in Iraq, over 864,000 bottles of water were consumed each month at one forward operating base, with that number doubling during hotter months. And even more concerning, of course, are the risks posed by the need to resupply. More than 3,000 U.S. soldiers were killed or wounded from 2003 to 2007 in attacks on fuel and water convoys in Afghanistan and Iraq. So there are direct threats uh, to our troops, to infrastructure and military operations from, from climate change that are important to take into account as climate security risks. But as I noted, you know, they, the risks are much broader than that, and there's a broader discussion now, and even security experts are much more worried about the threats posed by climate impacts to water, food, health, and biodiversity, for example, than to militaries themselves. The International Military Council on Climate and Security uh, conducted a survey of security experts again this year, the second year in a row we've done that, to find out how they rack and stack climate security risks. And what we found this year was that respondents said climate change will have moderate to high impacts on military infrastructure, installation, and operations, but the society's disrupting threats to agriculture, sanitation, health, economic and environmental systems were all much higher in their minds um, over the next 20 to 30 years. So that brings me to the second bucket of risk that we look at, which is the con contributions that climate change can make to political instability and conflict risk within states. And here again, you have what, what Steve talked about, internal migration, either due to acute events or slow onset stresses, and migration is, of course, a largely a positive adaptation strategy for stressed communities. But when climate effects force large numbers of people to move quickly or in irregular patterns, it can contribute to political instability within states and lead to external migration. A report from the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies earlier this year found that in the six month period between September 2020 to February 2021, around 10 million people worldwide were displaced due to natural hazards. You also have resource stress and an expanding gap between what populations demand and what governments can provide. An example here that's relevant to NATO, I think, is Basra, Iraq, where it exemplifies some of these complex dynamics. It's a city of approximately 4 million people. It sits at the, the confluence of the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers before entering into the Persian Gulf. Due to a combination of climate change, upstream infrastructure development, and poor governance practices, the Iraqi government in 2018 estimated the water flow in these rivers had been reduced by 30% since the 1980s. Then you have the combination of less fresh water flow, sea level rise, and environmental degradation. Saltwater intrusion into the region has increased, which negatively impacts agriculture and fish farming. The lack of clean water in the city has led to periodic outbreaks of waterborne disease, as well as the eruption of anti-government protests. And in January 2019, an estimated 15,000 people had been displaced in the region due to water shortages. 
I see that my time is, is up here, but just I'll end by saying developments in Basra have contributed to broader instability and political challenges in an already fragile country with the potential to undermine NATO missions elsewhere in Iraq. And you could find an example like this in many different parts of the globe. So this is just one illustration. The third bucket is something Rachel talked about quite a bit is this exacerbation of competition and contestation between states further straining the international system. She talked about it in Asia. We also see it in the Arctic where it matters to NATO as well. So I'll stop there. I think there's many different directions we could go in the questions, but happy, happy to answer those uh, from, from folks as well. Right, thank you, Erin. I think you, you showed us that climate change is not a risk as such, but it affects the risks we are already facing and it accelerates them. It fuels the new conflicts uh, that are already out there. Uh, and you also showed us that NATO is facing several buckets of risks, several different areas that they need to pay attention to. So again, NATO has to transform. And I have several questions for you. I'll, I'll, pick, I'll pick one. Um, you talked about framing, your, uh, framing how climate change intersects with other risks. Can you give a specific example of that, what we are experiencing today? So the intersection with other risks? Sure, sure. So I think, you know, one, you could, again, you could kind of spin a globe and put your finger down and, and find a place where this is a challenge. But I, I look to East Africa, for example, where in 2020, you had the confluence of drought, as well as flooding, uh, due to that variability that I was talking about before. You have uh, a locust plague, which was due in part to climate change in that affected uh, the, the Arabian Gulf you had COVID and you have weak governance in many of these states and the risks of ethnic conflict. When you mix all of those together, you have a very uh, insecure and unstable environment. And as the head of the World Food Program in the area was quoted in the Times last year, said it's shock upon shock upon shock. So when you have governments that are already very strained in trying to respond to uh, citizen demands and, and conflicts, when you layer climate change on top of that, it just exacerbates the problem. Well, thank you, Erin. And I guess our next speaker will be able to add more uh, examples of this yeah. to the table. Uh, and our next speaker is uh, Dr. Benjamin Pohl. And he currently is the head of program uh, of climate diplomacy and security at Adelphi Institute in Germany. Uh, and here he focuses on the impact of global environmental change on, on foreign security and development policy. He has been working for five years at the interface of peace building and global sustainable development. He advises foreign ministries and development agencies on creating synergies between adaptation to climate change and peace building, as well as promoting cooperation in international river basins. Uh, he has done much research on the global strengthening of cross-border cooperation in international river basins, such as the Nile and the Central Asian rivers. And he also worked on global food security and is responsible for the ECC textbook, Environment, Conflict and Cooperation. So a very knowledgeable man, uh, Dr. Paul, and he will show us how climate change affects local and regional security in the Sahel region a uh, region we haven't talked about until now, one of the most affected regions in the world when it comes to climate change. Ben, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, General. And because I know I'm at the end of a, of a long uh, lineup of, of great speakers, I've brought some slides just to, um, uh, to make it easier, hopefully, to follow. Um, so I've been asked to, uh, to, to, to speak about the uh, climate-related security risks in the Sahel, um, and if you were to wonder why, then I think uh, this map might give you an idea. And it overlays uh, climate exposure and, 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 and fragility in the darkest shades cover a, a lot of the areas that we've already talked about, but in particular the Sahel and, and, and Central Africa and the Horn of Africa. And this is sadly where we find uh, among the lowest um, uh, human development index scores, um, poor governance, um, high climate vulnerability and, and, and seemingly endemic conflicts. So when we speak about climate security risks, this is among the first regions that, uh, that, that, we, that we often consider. Um, it is a vast region. And so I would like to focus on one 
widely cited example in particular, which is, is Lake Chuck Basin. Here's just a little bit of, uh, of a map to help you find it. And because it's such an often cited example, um, uh, some years ago, we chose it for the first ever climate fragility risk assessment. Um, and assessment that, that, that very deliberately um, combined extensive qualitative uh, conflict research by, by local researchers and, uh, and the climate and, and, and a hydrological assessment. And it wasn't cheap, but let me tell, me, let me tell you already, it, it was worth it. Um, and I think many of you will have seen uh, images like this, um, you know, along a narrative of, of a lake shrinking uh, due to climate change, destroying um, livelihoods and thereby contributing to one of the, of the greatest uh, humanitarian disasters of our time. And that humanitarian disaster, uh, sadly, um, is a reality, uh, as is the impact of, of, of climate change. Um, but to our great surprise, what we didn't find was a, was a shrinking lake. Um, um, but instead, what we, what we saw, what we found was that the lake is actually highly variable at different time scales. So here I'll show you another uh, set of images where you can see that the lake has been has been refilling again. But the point is uh, very much that um, some annual date doesn't tell you very much. It doesn't tell you anything because below you'll see a monthly uh, the monthly data for one year. And as you as you can see, uh, at least if you, if you squint, it changes a lot um, uh, over uh, during during a single year. So just the uh, just the the year uh, the carries no meaning, um, and what we also found was that while the lake has um, uh, is highly variable, the water volume has actually been 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 growing over the past years. Even if, as you see in the in the, in the map on the right, uh, it has it has shrunk uh, before. Now I do want to emphasize that it is a climate fragility hotspot. But that's due to what Aaron talked about, about uh, the, uh, due to the increasing uncertainty, uh, the increasing variability and increasing uncertainty in precipitation and the increase in, in extreme weather events. And together with the ongoing conflict, uh, these result in four risks that are locking um, Lake Chad into, into a climate conflict trap. And the first risk is that the, the dynamics of the ongoing conflict, that they undermine people's adaptive capacity to deal with an increasingly variable climate because a large number of people have been displaced, because people's movement has been very restricted by, by the conflict and the military, and because social cohesion has been, has been weakened by years of, of violence. And, and that results in, 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 in increased competition over the natural resources that remain accessible because so many people are displaced and because there's so many areas cannot be accessed and because the previous governance institutions, they don't work anymore because communities, community leaders were the, were the first to be killed or to flee or to be proven powerless. So there's no one left anymore who can diffuse the, 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 the conflicts that, that come up over, over natural resources. The third risk is, is, is the recruitment into armed opposition troops. So in the context of increasingly vulnerable livelihoods because of both climate change and conflict, the financial incentives and, 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 and frankly, the services that these armed, group, uh, armed groups offer are, are relatively uh, more attractive. And the fourth risk is, is the one that comes with uh, very heavy handed military responses. So by not allowing people access to um, certain areas and certain livelihoods, the security forces actually undermine communities' resilience and their ability to adapt to climate change and thereby they fuel uh, the very grievances that are driving the conflict. So they're counterproductive ultimately. Now, to sort of finish it off, the, um, the all important question, why would you care? Why would you care uh, whether the lake is shrinking or whether something else is the problem? And of course, um, uh, you, you should care because it matters once we start trying to design solutions. If the shrinking lake were the problem, we could simply recharge it. And uh, incidentally, that is what, what some actors are, are really pushing for. But it would be a solution that, that actually misses the problem, that might um, make it worth because, uh, worse because um, it, it may actually hurt the populations that are relying on fluctuating lake uh, for, for recession agriculture. 
it's obviously ecologically risky and the opportunity costs of, 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 of building a pipeline of some that's estimated uh, ex, ex ante to cost some $50 billion, of course, uh, breathtaking. Imagine what you could do for the region with that type of money. And what I just want to argue is that this, you know, I would have, I would have thought this is something we would, we would know, um, you know, something as basic as the size of the lake, um, that it could be subject to such a great misunderstanding of the international community. Uh, that's, that's really a surprise. Um, and I see Tom coming up and that brings me my last slide. I'm not going to talk about it, but um, it sort of, it, it links to the next session already on what to do. And there's, I, I will not go into 10 entry points, but I want to stress the one, which is the need to build, rebuild social cohesion. And I'm stressing this because it's so important, but constantly relegated to the future because of the perceived urgency of, of countering terrorism. And that needs to change. And, uh, you know, the local needs for rule of law, for climate adaptation, sustainable development, they need to be at the center of our interventions. And that's it. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Ben. And uh, I think it gave a very clear view on, on the, the, the spiral that this region is in. And to me, the Sahel region is, is like a canary in the coal mine. So they are the, the warning indicator of uh, what we will all be facing in the future, but it's happening there first. Uh, and I think this is the, the many ways in which uh, climate change affects uh, the security in that region, uh, which is also important for us, uh, because many of the, the weapon flows, the human trafficking, the extremist uh, threats uh, origin in, in fragile countries, that are very vulnerable to, to climate change. So uh, I think this is not just an African problem, it should also be our problem. And building resilience in this region is also helping to build resilience in our own region, in our own countries. Uh, so that's why we should invest in that. I have one question from you from the audience, uh, Ben. Uh, how do you uh, suggest that governments and concerned groups rebuild social cohesion? What kind of programs and mechanisms could be used? Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a very good question. Um, and, and, and I think um, a lot of this comes down to, to, to maybe interventions that we would, that, uh, you know, that would be, um, let's say, uh, general development interventions that we would think about that, but that would need to be done differently so as to strengthen that social cohesion. So as I said, I mean, a big problem is that these communities have been displaced very often repeatedly. So people have no one to draw on. There's no, there's no more trust within and between these communities because their lives have been turned upside down. So what we need is, um, uh, is, is something that um, restores this trust within the community, but also between communities and state. And the state. So, so one thing is with uh, with climate adaptation, for example, um, what farmers and, and uh, yeah, farmers especially need is some uh, some form of, of of seasonal forecasting that would be really important, so that they know if they plant now, they actually get a uh, they actually can uh, can harvest something. But it's and it's for, it's actually information that um, that is being produced by the Lake Chad Basin Commission, um, but it's not being disseminated in the in the local languages. Uh, so, so, so one very practical thing might be to have a radio program that actually, um, where people can call in and and, and sort of, uh, you know, where 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 this uh, this information and 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 what it means for uh, for for agriculture is being disseminated, sort of in, in a very cheap extension service, and and where people can can discuss, so that the state is not um, is not primarily perceived as as a. Uh, as someone who collects taxes and who restricts livelihoods, but who's actually providing something, and that's a that's a that's a huge issue in the region. Um, in, in some of the interviews, people said that um, reported that before the conflict, they didn't know which country they lived in, because they had never ever encountered anyone from the government. No school, no hospital, no customs, nothing. Um, and, and back then, it was working better than when the government arrived in the form of security forces who determined. Oh, if you're fishing or if you're growing red pepper, then you're part of the terrorists and we're going to come after you. And, and instead, of course, what, what we need is, 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 is a far more, is a far more um, uh, supportive uh, an environment. And, and so peace building interventions that are, so development interventions that also have a peace building purpose that, that sort of bridge that um, the, the silos of, of development and peace building, that's, that's what's, uh, what's critically important. 
Okay, thank you. And we have one uh, uh, room for one more question, but we need to keep the answers short. Uh, it's a, a question from uh, a colleague from you uh, of the Potsdam Institute. So, and the question is, how do we protect the most marginalized groups in the Sahel, such as the pastoralists, who are also more vulnerable to recruitment into armed groups in search of more security, without stirring up additional intercommunal uh, polarization within those countries? Yeah, very good question. And not made for a very short answer, I have to, I have to say, but it's, it, it's, it's really about involving them in the decision making that leads to development, because one of the problems is that, you know, we think they have, don't have enough water, let's drill some boreholes. Uh, but what then happens, you drill the boreholes for the pastoralists, but then the people come and settle there. That's something that came up in a, in a recent crisis group report on the, on the climate security risks in Sahel. And, and then so the pastoralists are pushed out in, into even more marginalized areas. So very often they don't want the, the water boreholes because it, they know what will happen. So the, the really the critical thing is make them part of the solution rather than you know, thinking you can provide the solution for them and basically assuming all uh, pastoralism, that's, that's uh, early human history. We're now going toward husbandry and we know, you know, this, this is more productive. Don't do that. Involve them. Well, thank you. Thank you uh, for, for the great answers also. Uh, and I would like to thank all the speakers for their excellent contributions. Uh, I think it really put the different dimensions of how climate change affects security on the table and gives us all a, a more clearer view of the problem that we are facing. Uh, and I would also like this, to take this opportunity to make an announcement uh, because we discussed uh, the climate, the Global Climate and Security Report 2020. Uh, we use that kind of as a basis for our discussion, but the next one is coming up. So next month, a new version of this report will be published in a, uh, in a NATO happening. Uh, so we are all looking forward to that and uh, I hope you'll read it and it can help you to find the answers we are all looking for. Uh, and I think this discussion made very clear that that is needed. I've been working in crisis areas for all of my life uh, and never before did we have so much advanced warning of the next crisis we are facing. Never before was there so much scientific evidence available. And never before did we have the luxury uh, of uh, being able to prepare ourselves for a next crisis. And that makes that turns it into kind of an obligation, an obligation to be prepared. And the COVID crisis shows us what the price can be if we don't, if we let time slip through our fingers and don't prepare ourselves. So I would say let's shift from calling for action to really designing and initiating actions. And that's what's being done in the next panel discussions. So I wish you all good luck and a lot of uh, inspiration to really make that next step into action. Again, Thanks to all the good speakers here, uh, and I wish you a very fruitful first.